All right. Hey, welcome everybody to today's class. Uh, today we're talking about winter interest in the garden. We have landscape designer Mary Kirk Menefee with us today. Um, thankfully, <laughs> I know she had to fight some traffic to get here. So we're glad that she's with us today. Um, just a couple of notes while everybody's getting logged in. We are expecting a bit of a crowd today. Um, so just want to welcome back those of you who have been joining us for classes, who have been to classes with us in the past. We're glad you're with us. Um, if you are new, welcome. We're really glad you're here. Um, we just have a few notes. This is a webinar style program. Um, so unlike some of the other Zoom meetings that you've been on, uh, we actually can't see your face. We can't talk to you during the class. So if you have questions, uh, you'll type those into the Q&A box on your menu. And at certain times through the presentation, Mary Kirk will be able to take those questions. Um, we are recording today. Um, following the class, uh, we can send out some links and uh, you guys can follow up if you have any questions that aren't answered. Those lines of communication stay open, so we're always happy to help you. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. Mary Kirk, uh, I think that's about it. <laughs> All right, uh, just wanna say a big thank you to Mary Kirk, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand the presentation over to her so she can start talking about winter interest. Thanks for being with us today. All right. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Kirk Finnefy. I'm a landscape designer here at Maryfield. I've been uh, doing this for about 15 years and um, I've talked a few times about winter interest in the garden. Um, if you've ever come to one of our seminars on this topic, you may have seen some of this before, but I hope to uh, make it fresh for this season. And it seems like uh, wintry sort of weather has uh, come upon us and we're uh, kind of ready to go in thinking about uh, what happens after all the beautiful leaves begin to drop. So uh, I'm going to get into this presentation here. Um, I think it's, here we are. Does it look good, Sally? Yeah, you look, it's good. Okay, great. So uh, we will get started. For, the first thing we're gonna do is have um, a question for all of you. And let's see, there we go. Um, I want to know how many hours would you say you spend per week in your garden or out in nature, people hiking, that sort of thing, uh, between December 1st and March 31st? And just, um, we'll, we'll give a few seconds, but for those of you who are new to this, um, you'll see that poll. All right, I see answers coming in quickly. So that's gonna pop up on your screen. Uh, just take a, we'll give a couple seconds for people to answer and then I'll end it and show the results. All right, we'll give a few more seconds. All righty, looks like most of our answers have come in. Right, oh, pretty even split here. Um, all right. So th that's uh, good and interesting for me to know. Uh, so I can uh, hopefully encourage those of you who are on the, the lower number of hours to get yourselves out there and uh, for everybody else to uh, have some ways to tune in and better enjoy what you see when you're there. So um, I, I will say that quite often I get questions and concerns about winter interest right around that end of March timeframe. No one ever seems to be terribly worried about it at this time of year. Uh, so those of everybody who's here, good on you for uh, coming in and getting ready for winter interest ahead of time. Um, it's in late March that everyone's totally, totally sick of it. And um, really wants to know, well, what can I do to have winter interest? But I find that when I ask people about, well, you know, what might you want to see in January and what have you, many, many people say, oh, I don't, I don't even see it. I drive up to my house. All I really want is to see uh, something going on when I drive up to my house for the couple minutes a day that that happens. So 
we can talk about that. We can talk about ways to balance that with having it look nice the rest of the year. Uh, but what I really want to encourage everyone to do through this presentation is to really tune into the winter garden and to nature in general during the winter, because the more you notice, the more interesting it becomes. So on that note, um, I will just, just to emphasize what people say about the winter garden. Um, I'm always hearing that it's dead and barren. And <laughs> a funny, funny thing, I, because this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, I have taught my children who are seven and five that nothing is dead in the winter. The trees aren't dead, the hostas aren't dead, nothing is dead, they're all just dormant. And, and my son, <laughs> irked his teacher a little bit the other day because he corrected her on that uh, when she said that the, the trees were all dying for the winter. So um, I hope not to make you rude and impertinent to anyone in your life, but if uh, you could keep in mind that everything is going through its natural cycle. Uh, yes, they plants look tired because they are tired. They've been doing a whole lot of work all year long. And now is they're going into their time of rest, which they really need. Uh, when you see all those just sticks in the winter, uh, th those are the natural stems of the plants. They're, they're, they're resting. Uh, they're not there to be offensive and ugly. So, um, and then, you know, this issue of there's no color. Well, you have to look for it. Um, and, and again, you have to balance creating color in the winter with what you're going to have the rest of the year. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that as we go on. So how do you appreciate winter? And this is this little tongue in cheek slide here. Um, summer, pretty easy to appreciate. It's bright, it's colorful, it's, you know, throw caution to the wind. Anything goes in the summertime. In the winter, it's a little cozier, it's a little softer, it's a little uh, more tune in and appreciate. So um, I don't know, maybe that's, that's very appealing to some people. Maybe that's more of a cultivated taste to some people. All right, our next survey question. I'd like to know which thing would you prefer to see, you know, given anything you could choose, would you like to see the evidence of natural cycles in the garden? Would you like to see the things that have kind of that holiday vibe of berries and green? Or do you wanna try and have as many flowers and bloomy things that don't look wintry at all as possible in your garden? All right, I'm gonna have everybody a minute to answer this or you know, 15, 20 seconds so they can read all the answers, but looks like Result answers coming in fast now. And I know that there's no all of the above choice, guys. So just give, give me, if you can only choose one, what, it'll, what will it be? All right, looks like we're... All right, well, I, I, you have surprised me. Um, I also enjoy seeing the evidence of the natural cycles. Um, so that, that's great. We're going to talk a lot about that. Cool. All right. So uh, on that note, uh, the great Pierre Uro once said, the garden in winter is an emotional experience. You think in terms of decay and disappearing and coming back. You feel the life cycle of nature. Uh, and I think that that's kind of a, a beautiful way of thinking about it. So what is the, this life cycle? Uh, we have this is a, a magnolia and I'm probably not the same magnolia picture to picture, but you know, you get the gist. Um, we have the fuzzy bud, one of my very favorite late winter things, the fuzzy magnolia bud. And then the bud is emerging. It's blooming out into a flower. That flower is gonna get pollinated and it's going to become a seed head. And so you go from winter to early spring to late spring to summer around to the fall and uh, the, the cycle goes again. So we can look at almost every plant and find some evidence of this cycle. All plants need to reproduce, so they're all gonna do it in some way. Conifers are gonna use cones. Um, 
the angiosperms are going to use flowers and some are small and hard to notice and some are big and showy but we can generally always find them all right so winter as i said is the restful time of year and um, i'm sure a lot of a lot of us out there kind of need that rest too i don't know if we'll get it or not um, but the the plant world is certainly going to take its rest so we can reflect on the the cycle that has been with all the seed heads and the berries and the cones all of the products and we do that as we celebrate the harvest season uh, in our our cultural celebrations we have a lot of of reflection going on toward the ends of the year and then as we kind of go through the center and over into the late winter um, and who knows where that line is between what is winter and what is spring. Sometimes I think it's kind of an emotional line. Uh, we can see that we're anticipating what's to come. The little shoots coming out, the, the very, very early blooming things. And uh, one that I always like to really uh, focus on, and you see the picture kind of in the bottom, middle of the bottom row, that's a maple. And you will see across late February into March that all of a sudden all of the maples appear to be sort of shimmery fuzzy red and that's the, the time that the maples are blooming that's their flower and when you see that that red you can know that that spring is about to be there so um and that there we go from reflection to anticipation Winter is also, in, and to get onto a more design note, winter is about structure. You, you lay bare the structure of your garden in winter. Um, all the, the showy, fluffy things go away and you really see how the layout works, how uh, the structure of the plants themselves work, how they've been either pruned or not. Uh, and then all of the actual structures that you place in the garden. So if winter is the absolute perfect time to tweak your layout, if you're looking and you, you see that, oh, there's really an imbalance to the structure or there, there's no clear focal point or man, that, that tree really looks like it's gotten very cluttery over the last couple of years and needs a pruning. Those are all things to be focusing on in the winter. And winter, of course, is classically the time for planning. So you can sit down with your graph paper or meet with a designer and, and start to replan the structure of your garden if that's what needs to happen. Or you can get out and actually do some of these things. We do not have harsh winters here in Virginia. Uh, and they seem to be getting less harsh all the time. You're gonna have plenty of days where it's lovely and 50 degrees and you just need a warm pair of boots and uh, some you know, good outerwear. And you can go out and do your woody pruning, which is perfect to do in the dormant period. Um, you can do things like cutting out new beds and uh, you know, if you need to get rid of ivy, winter's a great time to do chores like that. So um, plenty of work you can keep doing in the garden through the winter. All right, and then my, my kind of favorite thing, winter is about noticing. And I would say that I did not notice anything about plants in winter in my entire childhood or early adulthood. It was not until I did my graduate work to become a landscape designer and had to do all my plant classes right on through the winter that I began to notice all the little things. And now it is absolutely one of kind of the delights of my life to watch the, the seasons change. Uh, and it's even better with, uh, now that I have kiddos who do this with me, uh, my daughter pointed out the other day that the dogwood already has its buds. And yes, it does. It, it's, and that, that's just a wonderful thing to look out there and see that the dogwood, the rhododendron, uh, lots of things are already getting ready for spring. So um, we, you can see all the little signs coming, the bulbs poking up, the buds swelling, uh, and then eventually things beginning to bloom. Um, a lot of winter things to notice are a little more subtle. So uh, they may not be you know, smacking you in the face. So you've got to get out there and really look for them. 
All right, so our last survey question. Would you be willing to give up prime real estate in your garden for a collection of winter interest plants, even if they were gonna be boring in the summer or the spring and fall? All right, we'll give everyone a few seconds to answer. All right. All right, we've got answering. Looks like it's slowing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and end it. There you go. All right, great, great to know. So uh, for those of you who answered no, um, then I, you may just say that winter is not your season. And that is absolutely perfectly acceptable. And if there's good strong overlap between the people saying no and the people who said that they only go out for less than two hours, ideal. Absolutely perfect. If you're not going to see it, why give up the real estate? And I really want everybody to know there's nothing wrong with that. Just because we're uh, think we're on a topic of winter interest doesn't mean it has to be everybody's thing. So uh, hopefully you'll stick around though, and you know for whatever reason brought you here that you'll get get something out of the rest of the presentation. So we're getting into the okay noticing reflecting, emotion, it's all so wonderful, but like nitty gritty, how do we get this done? How do we do it? So first off, going back to that structure in the garden, uh, as you're starting to think about those things, look for your edges, look for your transition points. Do you have clear paths? Do you have a uh, clear designation between this area and that area? in a structural way. Now that doesn't mean that the plants don't grow in and come and make all the lines blurry and fuzzy and very naturalistic uh, when in the growing season. I, I love that. I love a hard line with fuzzy plants kind of messing it up. But in the winter time when you can see that structure, do you have those crisp clear lines? Uh, are your plants masked up? Are they layered? Do you have things in the winter that create a show together. Most winter interest plants are not real great standalone things. Uh, they really work best so classically redwood dogwood. One redwood dogwood doesn't really do a whole lot. A mass of redwood dogwoods that catch the sun right at the uh, time of the day that it's kind of slanting in uh, with some evergreens behind, that's gonna be really exciting. Um, do you have where you have the deciduous plants that are going away in the winter, uh, your, your classic little sticks sticking up? Uh, do you have evergreens providing some structure? Do you have them at the uh, ends of buildings, at the end of stru paths, structures, as focal points? Uh, do they create a border to the edge of the bed? I know everybody thinks uh, liriope is just the world's most boring plant but it's so useful for things like bordering out a bed. Um, and are your deciduous trees, are they pruned and placed architecturally? If you need something that's a focal point, could you put an architectural winter tree there? So speaking of architecture, you can think about all the things that go in the garden. If you're looking out and you see, gosh, you know, my view out my kitchen window is just pretty boring. It may have some evergreens, but there's not a lot to look at. Is that a perfect place to put a really neat bird feeder and watch those birds come through the winter time? And it doesn't have to be just like the most utilitarian bird feeder you've ever seen in your life. There are absolutely beautiful ones you could choose that add that interest. And then Lastly, my very favorite technique for dealing with the winter. Uh, and this is why I asked the survey question. I believe that it works best to create vignettes. And what I mean by that is pulling together a bunch of winter interest plants in one place. Like I said, winter interest plants tend to be a little more subtle and a little showier when they're in groups. So if you scatter them here and there and everywhere in the garden, chances are it's going to end up looking like, it's going to end up emphasizing that the garden's pretty bare. You, you don't have much going on except, oh, there's that random heather over there. Oh, there's that random hellebore over there. There's that one red twig dogwood uh, looking kind of puny 
by itself. So you're looking around and your attention's drawn to all these different little things that just tend to look disappointing. What if they were all together? If you have one place, and I like to pick a place that is more likely to be seen in the winter. So it may be right there in front of your house, or it may be an island bed right near your driveway. It might be that view out the kitchen window, anywhere that you're going to see more often from um, in the winter time. And it, just to say that again, views from the window are often what we see in the winter. It may not be about looking at it outside. So you might want to pick something that's more toward the edge of the property, but that is a focal point out of the window. So at any point, you choose your spot, someplace that you're really going to see in the wintertime, and then group up things that are, uh, they go, of course, go together. You don't want to necessarily have uh, your fuchsia colored camellia right next to your mandina berries. You know? have some cohesion there, but you can group those winter interest plants so that you really have just a superstar thing to look at. And everything else that's kind of boring, that's the sticks in the winter, or that's just the plain old evergreens that get kind of dullish in the winter anyway, those are going to fade into the background. We're not going to notice that those are kind of boring because we have the one big uh, interest focal point. So that, I, I think that's the best way to uh, really create that winter interest. And then also the, um, the other upside to this is that you leave some of these other areas to be showy in their season. So you have some place that's spring, you have some place that's summer, you have some place that's fall. And um, that way your whole garden becomes that wonderful four season garden where every single month of the year something is going on and there's something to look at. But the expectation is not that every square inch is doing that all the time. So it's a really, really challenging thing to pull off. It, it, it is in fact possible, but with enormous amounts of gardening and work. Um, and if you're into that, fantastic, I love it. Uh, most of us do not have the, the time, <laughs> even if we have the interest. So um, that, that's something that we could go see at some of the great, you know, winter tour or something like that, uh, but not necessarily on our own properties. So uh, just to circle back, the way to get that four season garden on your own property without having uh, daily gardening to do is to kind of concentrate things into these vignettes. All right, so I, I want to stop here, Sally, and uh, see if anybody has any questions before we go into the catalog of winter interest things that I know everybody wants to see. All right, yes, we do have a couple of questions um, that have come in, and some of them you may choose, you may be addressing later on in the presentation. Um, the first one was just specific. She saw a plant that the, I think it was the red twig dogwood with the bright red branches in one of your earlier photos. Whoops. Oh my. She wanted to know what that was. And I think it's the red twig dogwood, but. Is it the one here in the mm. upper right-hand corner? Uh, I think it was the one previous slide. Yes, upper right. Okay, yep, yeah, that's a red twig dogwood and probably like an Arctic fire dogwood or something like that, mixed in with a few other things. Okay, all right. Um, okay, next we have someone who's looking for a suggestion for slow growing evergreens. Um, and a person who's looking for some ideas about um, plants that are good for all four seasons. So these may be things you're going to be starting to address, but uh, those are the questions that have come in so far. Well, um, let's see. I, I can go ahead and address those. Um, <laughs> slow growing evergreens. There are many slow growing. No, it would be going in a patio planter. In a patio planter, yes, um, I would say that the more important thing is that the plant takes a container. Um, whether something grows quickly or slowly, whether it'll thrive in a container is going to be more relevant to the success. Um, which, of course, boxwoods do fantastically in containers. Um, a lot of your little specimen dwarf evergreens, your hinoki cypresses, your deodora cedars. Uh, pines, those will all do fine if the container is large enough and the drainage is very well managed. 
uh, that, that's probably the number one problem you would have with an evergreen in a container is that the drainage would become compacted and poor and then the plant ends up drowning. Um, it's also just to kind of say for containers in general that especially with your evergreens, um, you, of course, you don't want them to drown, but you don't want them to dry out. A lot of evergreen plants will not tell you they have dried out very quickly. A hydrangea, you know. You know when that thing is dry. You know before it's too dry that you need to water it. And evergreen will not necessarily tell you. And it goes from looking wonderful to looking dead uh, irreparably uh, overnight. But the problem occurred, you know, like three weeks ago or something. So managing your evergreen in your container is uh, very important. If it's something that is not perfectly cold hardy, uh, you also want to make sure that there's some level of insulation for it in the winter. The containers do not have the benefit of um, the ground soil to stick, keep from freezing. So there, there's kind of a lot to, to do with that, but um, I would say if you're not choosing a fast growing evergreen like Ligustrum, let's say, you're probably going to very easily be able to manage the growth rate and size on an evergreen in that container. Um, for the other question, plants that do a four season thing. I'm going to kind of give you a wishy-washy answer because much depends on your own perspective of what is interesting. So um, let's say a dogwood, that's kind of a classic four season plant, also my favorite tree. Um, spring is a definite yes. I don't know I, if you can find me a person who thinks that dogwood flowers in the springtime are boring. Um, I, I've, I'll give you a gift card here at Merrifield. Um, however, summer, I don't know, is, is it has leaves on it. That's fantastic. They're not really doing very much. Um, is that interesting to you? Is it not interesting to you? Fall. They color up early. It's this really pretty sort of rust red color. Uh, often they have these little berries on them. So very interesting in fall usually. Um, I, I can always love being able to see all the dogwoods early in the fall. And then uh, what about winter? I love watching those buds. I love that they are all over the plant. Sometimes they get like the little ice strips on them, which is really magical. And then they're kind of slowly growing, growing, growing and opening into, and then it's spring. So I love that. Would you find that interesting? I don't know. Um, so there, there, you have to look at all that. It goes back to that life cycle. You have to look at that life cycle of the plant and see what is it doing to provide interest year round. And if that's, if all of those seasons are interesting to you, then it's a four season plant. If they're not, then it's a three season or a two season or a one season plant. Do we have anything that's gonna just like keep blooming all year long? Not really. I have a, one plant that I found that's kind of like this. It's my Daphne Eternal Fragrance. And it has been in bloom for, I would say 20 out of the last 24 months. Uh, with these lovely little white fragrant blooms. Uh, it keeps its leaves. It's one of the finickiest plants that I think you could buy. I have it in my garden because, you know, I wanted to try and so far so good. And I did some things to make the drainage kind of perfect. Um, so great. I've planted it for many customers and I had not so great success. So that's one I'm very cautious now about recommending to customers. So I'm not going to tell you all, hey, everybody go out and buy an eternal fragrance, Daphne. Um, but if you want to take it on, there, that, that is one plant I have found that does continuously uh, bloom. So hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions, Sally? Yeah, we've had a few more come in. Um, so we had a question. Uh, one person's interested in a uh, species that would provide habitat for wildlife during winter. Um, if you've had questions from that, um, that's something that she's interested in, in looking at. Okay, well, there are many, many wildlife habitat plants. Uh, the, the two things that we're gonna look for in a plant in the winter time are food and shelter. And so anything that's kind of thickety, 
uh, that's going to be a great shelter for animals that hang around in the winter. And then anything that produces a fruit or a seed is going to be food for animals. And they, they kind of have a, a rolling way they like to eat these things. Um, in this picture you see in front of you, you've got the winter berry holly. You're not going to go for that first. Usually you get to keep and enjoy those berries through a lot of the winter, but eventually the hungry animals, birds primarily, are going to get to that, uh, those berries in March or so. Um, other things like, for instance, I'm going back to the dogwood, the berries on my dogwood never last. I never really get to enjoy that show for very long because the animals are getting that and, and gathering them up. Um, all kinds of things, perennial plants, if you choose to leave up their seed heads, will provide seeds for birds. So for lists and things like that, um, I would check out the wildlife habitat. Oh shoot, I can't remember. Sally, do you know the name of the group that, that issues the wildlife habitat signs? Mm, it, I know we work with Plant Nova Natives. I'm not sure what the other group is, possibly the Audubon Society. And we have Andy Johnson on our own staff, who's a great resource for this stuff. Um, okay. so if you're interested in following so, up with us, I just say to all customers, send me an email. We can get you a bunch of resources on this. Yes, lot, lots of information out there on, on yep. things to plant. There's a lot, yes. Okay, we have Audubon and Ladin Wildlife Conservancy, Audubon at home. We have some other people who are interested in this. They're on the call. They're sending us chats. Okay, so Audubon at home, National Wildlife Federation. There's a ton of resources on that, um, which is great. Um, so we have a few more questions that have come in, Mary Kirk. So happy to keep sending them to you or if you're, you want to move on. I, I think we have time. Let, let's do two more questions now and then we'll do a little more presentation and then we can do more questions at the end. Okay, um, so the next question is back to the containers. Um, this person wants to know if you think it would be feasible to create a winter interest garden using containers on a deck if a deck is really what you have. Um, I, I absolutely think you can do that. Um, the Again, you have to really learn what it takes to grow things in a container. The more you know about how to guard container garden, the more diverse your garden can be. But there's no reason why you couldn't have hellebores and daffodils and all kinds of things growing from containers. If you want to do that, you gotta pay attention to sun and shade. You know, if your deck's out in the bright sun, maybe a hellebore isn't the thing to do. Maybe a camellia isn't the thing to do. Um, and certainly there's so many annuals. If, if your deck is uh, not gonna get you know, devoured by deer, you can have a great pansy and cabbage and what have you thing. And I used to be very down on cabbages and kales and things because they, they were like the thing planted out in the beds at the mall. Nobody has to use them that way. You can mix them in and they become this wonderfully architectural element to a container garden. So um, I'm all for uh, those kinds of annuals at this stage. Um, the other thing that is uh, that I tend to do with my containers that uh, in the growing season are filled with various annuals that can go with the season is I'll just empty the container and use fresh greens, um, trimmings from the Christmas tree or things that I just you know, buy at the garden center, berries, what have you, and just poke them down in the soil and create almost like a flower arrangement. And uh, it tends to last for a couple of months. Um, and then when it looks horrible sometime in February, I'm pretty much ready to rip it out and stick in some pansies. So the, you can be kind of seasonal with it as well. You don't necessarily have to have this sort of perma container garden. Um, and, it, and again, kind of going back to that notion of uh, the vignettes and whether something is interesting or boring at different times, if you calibrate your whole container garden to be interesting in the winter without any seasonal change out, chances are it's gonna be a little bit blah in the summertime. So, um, and that may be totally cool for you. And if it is, go for it. Uh, but if it's not, if you're thinking like, gosh, I really, what, what appears to be super interesting in winter is gonna look blah in the summer, then maybe emphasize a little more seasonality and switch things up uh, season to season. That makes sense. Thank you, Mary Kirk. Um, 
The next question is um, some interests for native plants. So they want to know if you have any evergreens you really like that are native oh. to the area. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Get me on my soapbox. Um, we do not have very many evergreen native plants at all, just to begin with. Um, if you kind of want to know what grows in, natively in the winter, take a hike in January and see what you see. Um, it's not much. There are a few. We have, um, and, and of course, two favorites that are dear to many hearts are mountain laurel and rhododendron. I cannot say that I have planted a mountain laurel for a customer that has ever lived. If they grow naturally on your property, uh, because it's just kind of part of that need of habitat, then enjoy and that's wonderful and maybe your soils would be conducive to adding a few more and maybe it would work for you. Um, mountain laurels are not going to grow in the uh, foundation soil that was excavated up when they dredged your basement and what have you. It's just not going to do it. So um, it, hiking is the best way to enjoy a mountain laurel. Um, rhododendron better, still a little finicky. Um, you have to have very good drainage for a rhododendron. And sometimes if you have Phytophthora in the soil, they're gonna get root rot anyway. Um, if you can grow them, then they can grow huge and enormous and wonderful. And um, I have one in my garden that I rescued from a uh, poor little shade garden whose tree came down and it became a sun garden and all the plants had to go. And uh, the little rhododendron didn't have a home, so he came to my house and um, limped along for a couple of years and finally is beginning to grow big and wonderful. So um, if you have a conducive environment to a rhododendron, then that's a fantastic native evergreen to have. Um, others are the uh, American holly, Ilex opaca. Um, if you need a nice big tree, I, they're wonderful. And what a wildlife plant, so great. If you need to do any screening, particularly if you have some kind of shady screening you need to do, it's, a, it's naturally an understory woodland or woodland edge tree. So it's one of the few evergreens that will do some screening in the shade. Uh, if you have the space for it, go for it. It's great and it'll give you that, that great kind of holiday vibe with all the red berries. Um, what else do we have? We have inkberry holly, loves a wet area. Uh, if it dries out, it, it doesn't tend to fare as well. It's a, it kind of is a little box woody looking thing until inevitably it gets a little leggy. They're notorious for getting a little leggy. So if you want something that's gonna stay in a perfect little globe, it's not gonna be your plant. If you want something that can kind of grow and be full and have something in front of it to hide that legginess, it's a great evergreen to use. And it tolerates a range of uh, soil conditions and uh, light environments. So um, it, it's, it's just not the little tight thing you necessarily buy um, after three or five years. So, um, there, there may be a few other ones here and there that, oh, I for, almost forgot about, and it's right here in the picture, um, our native juniper, we call it Eastern red cedar a lot of times, or Virginia cedar. And everybody thinks it's like this trash plant that just grows on the side of the highway by itself. And people tend to pull them out as weeds all the time, um, but they're beautiful. And another really wonderful wildlife plant, they get these great blueberries on them. And um, another plant that it, it's a little more um, preferring of sun than the holly, but a great screening plant if you need to do any uh, screening. It's going to be fast growing and, and really do a good job. So there may be some others that I've left off. Um, yes, yes, there is. Oh, gosh, I'm really running through here. Bad my pictures are helping me. Um, hemlocks. Our native hemlock is another shade loving evergreen or shade tolerant evergreen, big tree. It's not a little small, small plant, um, cute little cones. You can see it up in the picture in the uh, one over from the left on the top. And uh, they do have a few pest and disease issues that are easily taken care of, but you have to watch for. Um, 
So those are those are the big guys that are big trees um, in oh, Southern Magnolia. Yes, tree form stuff. We're we're actually pretty good on evergreens. Um, it's the little shrubs. It's a little. Let me plant it right out in front of my house next to the steps and under the windows. That's where we lack a lot in our native plant palette, uh, which is why I've been kind of saying like, oh, we don't have much. Um, we don't have much of what many people ask me for all the time. We're great on uh, evergreen trees. And if you have space for them, please plant them. They're, they're amazing. Um, so anything, any other we can come up with, Sally, we can kind of follow up later. Yeah, definitely. I'm happy to send out a list following class um, We've or send at least you guys to some resources like Plant Nova Natives and some other things, because I know there's way more than we can actually name. <laughs> name and, well, and clearly I, I they're not at, at the top of my mind right now definitely so, but that gives us kind of a good segue into uh, my little plant catalog of all the different things you might include in your winter garden i know everybody always loves the palette of pictures so um i will run through what are on the the next few slides in terms of different categories of winter interest you might enjoy so our first category is fruits and seeds. And as I mentioned, we have, um, oh good, I do have a pointer thing. We have Easter red cedar, native hemlock. These are coneflower seed heads. This is, I believe, a clethra seed pod. Uh, Ketoniaster, um, a sedum that's got the seed head still on. This is a marshmallow or native hibiscus. Pyracantha, rose hips, sumac, some sort of little grass, probably a fountain grass, uh, miscanthus, and winterberry holly, which is uh, another great native, not evergreen, but very winter interesting. Um, also, dried foliage. Um, I know this is love it or hated. Some people are going to say, you know, this just makes them think of death and they don't want to see it and they'd rather just cut it down. Uh, personally, I would always leave all my dried stuff up until uh, early March or late February uh, because I think having something looks better than little stumps. Uh, but again, personal preference uh, rules the day. So here we have some uh, native panicum. Um, this is another grass, I'm not really sure. This is hycone grass that's been allowed to uh, stay and dry. Sometimes that'll happen and sometimes it won't. Um, this is, I'm not sure which one this is. That might actually be little blue stem and that's panicum. Anyway, grasses, we have lots of native plants. Uh, this is a um, pin oak or sawtooth oak that's going to keep its leaves through the winter. Beaches are also good for keeping leaves through winter. And then we have hydrangea. And this is the one that everyone complains about the sticks in the winter. Um, but why not leave those little flower heads on? I even once um, at a house I lived at, I went out and I sprayed the flower head silver and just let that be sort of a funky holiday thing. So uh, get creative with your dry foliage. Another great source of interest, and this is one where it's so fantastic to get out there and notice what's going on with the plants, is your, your bark and your stems. Here we have a paper bark maple. We have, I believe, a stewardia, although I could be wrong. Lots of plants do this neat camouflage thing. Um, our native sycamores do that in London Plains, which you see down here as well. The red twig dogwood. This is a lace bark oak a yellow twig dogwood. I'm gonna guess this is with the sinewy looking bark that's um, either gonna be a hornbeam or a crepe myrtle. Um, the crepe, some crepe myrtles, particularly the Natchez and Miami cultivars, get this cinnamon colored bark that's just amazing. Uh, this is a river birch and uh, uh, unidentified something that has cool stems. Then there's the shape and the branching of stems. You may not get a lot of color, but a lot of things give you really amazing branching. Two of my favorites for that are the spring blooming deciduous magnolias 
and uh, Japanese maples. Both can be sort of constructed at, through artful pruning over the years to have these really amazing shapes. The magnolias are gonna get the fuzzy buds, which makes them all the more amazing. Um, and then the maples, of course, have just phenomenally artistic shapes. I think both of these are Japanese maples here. This is definitely a hornbeam with this very sinewy sort of bark. It's cool. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but it's just cool looking with the frost on it. And this is a contorted filbert, also um, known as Harry Lauder's walking stick. Um, really amazing winter interest plant. It, it's kind of blobby looking in the summer, but the corkscrew sort of um, bark is so much fun in the winter time. And then lastly, we do have a lot of winter bloomers uh, and they tend to be, you know, a little hit and miss one in four years. It's going to be cold at the wrong time and kind of zap them. Uh, but the other three are going to be marvelous. And again, it's just a matter of do you want to give the real estate to that plant? If you, you know, will you notice it or will you miss having that spot for something colorful at a different time of year? Uh, if the answer is yes and then no, um, that then these are great things to include. Here you have Mahonia. There's a couple of different cultivars of Mahonia that are gonna bloom earlier or later, uh, always with these yellow blooms, followed by a blue droop, which is a kind of a showy fruit in the springtime. This is a prunus, uh, probably the early spring flowery or winter flowering apricot. Uh, which can't remember its botanical name. Uh, Okami cherries also often will bloom in the very late part of the winter. Here you have um, winter hazel or what's the other one? Winter hazel and uh, winter fragrant winter sweet. I always get those two confused. Whichever one that is, this one is the other. Um, but lots of yellow flowering things in the winter. Uh, wish I could tell you why it is. Maybe it has to do with what kind of animals are attracted to yellow flowers at the cold time of year. Um, but we do have a lot of yellow in the winter. Witch hazels, different from winter hazel, uh, tend to come in yellow or orangey colors. This is the cultivar Yelena. Uh, Arnold's Promise is the kind of sulfur yellow. If you can sight a witch hazel so that the sun shines through it in the afternoon, it looks like it glows. It's an amazing tree and it's gonna, um, or, or you can grow it as a shrub. And it's gonna bloom in uh, the February timeframe when not a lot of is going on. We also have a native uh, witch hazel, which blooms right around this time of year actually. Um, and it's very cool. Uh, you can see it growing right up on top of Old Rag Mountain. Uh, they, they're pretty easy to grow. They do tend to keep their leaves through the winter, which makes them look a little coarser. Um, and they tend to be a little shrubbier than the um, Asian ones, which you can prune up into tree form. Uh, another fuzzy bud sighting. Um, here we have, oh, what's that called? Jasmine, winter jasmine, uh, which I find to be, um, a kind of lackluster plant in the non-winter seasons, but gosh, when you see it cascading over a wall in uh, on, you know February 1st or something, it sure is a welcome sight to see this waterfall of yellow. And then here we have the heather, uh, which is a really neat winter plant to grow if you can grow it. it. It does not take well to poor drainage. It's really more of a rock garden type plant. So if you wanna grow heather, make sure you're creating conditions. You are unlikely to have that condition naturally. Uh, very few people do. Uh, so you need to create the conditions to grow the heather if that's something you wanna have. And then lastly, we have camellias, uh, which are just so beautiful. This is the cultivar Yuletide, which is gonna start blooming right around now. I saw some in bloom out in the parking lot. Um, and it's going to bloom kind of through the Yuletide season uh, with these nice bright red flowers and yellow centers. There are a number of fall blooming camellias. Most of them are either Camellia succinqua or hybrids uh, that are made to bloom in the fall. 
I tend to prefer the fall blooming camellias because they're less likely to get zapped. Um, I find them sometimes though a little bit hard to integrate into a fall landscape if you have this like pre nice bright pink and it's next to things that are blazing orange and red, it can be a little clashy. So siding, uh, color choice uh, become important. Th that is true of our new uh, reblooming azaleas that, that come in the fall as well. Um, also Camellia japonica and the cultivars that are made for winter and spring. You have a few that will bloom in January, February timeframe, most likely to get zapped. I tend to avoid those and go toward the ones that are a little bit more of a springtime plant that are gonna bloom in, in early spring, March, uh, and then often into April. Uh, fragrance. Oddly, there are so many fragrant winter plants. Maybe again, this is just an extra thing the plant has developed to entice those animals to come and visit when it's all cold outside. Uh, but you can uh, find a number of very intoxicating fragrances in the winter garden. Uh, here we have that winter sweet. We have a bodnet viburnum, which um, is sometimes hard to come by. You have to work with our buyers if that's something you want. Some of the camellias are fragrant. Here's that lovely Daphne. That's probably a Carol Mackey uh, winter Daphne, not my eternal fragrance, uh, but same family of plants. This is sweet box or sarcococa and your witch hazels, which have a fantastically herbal sort of scent. And then we do have some perennials uh, that last through the winter. Most of them, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and trim that old foliage in late February, early March, so that they can kind of get a fresh growth for the next year, um, but they will last through the winter and some like hellebore will even bloom. So here we have some cucaras, hit and miss on if it's gonna stay evergreen or if it's gonna go away for the winter, um, enjoy it while it lasts. You can leave it up as long as it looks good, cut it back when it doesn't. Uh, that's growing next to a little sedum, which is probably going to go completely away. Here's a duga, which will also often stay through the whole winter. Christmas fern, one of my very favorites, has a wonderful life cycle in the uh, heart of the growing season. It's going to be very upright, and then in the winter comes, it's going to kind of lay down, but it will stick around. Um, here we have... Uh, I can't tell if that's an Acorus or a Carex, but lots of the grassy things, Acorus, Carex, Liriope, will actually keep their color through the whole winter. This is Virginia. Um, it's a kind of a salad-y looking plant. It's green in the summertime, in the growing season, and then it gets this great red fall color that lasts through the winter. And then this one is Rhodia, which has sort of a big strappy leaf and uh, these great red little seed things that come up. So it's a nice winter interest guy. And then uh, going back to our more designy kind of elements, getting away from the plants, you don't necessarily have to have plants blazing their uh, interesting guns in order to have interest in the garden. You can also rely on accents and structures. Uh, if you have a water feature, you can usually keep it running uh, unless it gets really, really cold and then you wanna turn it off so it doesn't uh, freeze the pump. But the water trickling through ice and snow can be very cool looking, uh, which you see in two pictures. And then uh, things, gates and bridges and what have you, all these things that are very utilitarian um, and can be so boring. And when we're doing the work and it's everything looks beautiful in the spring and summer, we often forget that these things will be more noticeable in winter. So always keep in mind that uh, you might wanna make something that could be boring, in fact, quite detailed and interesting. Um, and then ways to kind of look at nature, I mean, well, mossy boulder, no, nobody can make that. Is, but they sure if you have a place that can uh, support something like that, what a what a way to have interest in the winter, and then you can attract in the the fun colorful birds. And as I said, a bird feeder doesn't have to be 
the uh, most basic utilitarian thing. It can be something lovely to look at. So um, just kind of to bring it home, emphasize the point, there's a lot to notice in the winter garden. Uh, I would guess that this picture is taken in February with witch hazels and maples beginning to bloom. Uh, maybe got a little mahonium blooming there. Um, here we have lots of things that have been done for winter. Grasses and red twig dogwood and evergreens and whatever that is, paperbark maple, maple here in the foreground. Now to my taste, this is a little splashy. Uh, this is a little bit like banging you over the head with, oh yes, things can be interesting in winter. I would imagine this is also very blah in the summer. Uh, but if you want to push it up to 11, there you go. Uh, something a little more subtle, we have a naturalized field of Helleborus. Uh, just you know, one plant doing the job, very cool. And then here we have that um, notion of dried plants and seed heads that might be bringing in all of the wildlife um, with the snow on it, it looks very lovely. If that snow's heavy and wet and everything is beaten down at the end, that's the time to just go ahead and cut it back. Um, here is a big mass of winterberry holly with some grasses in the foreground. I love that contrast of the straw color and the bright red and the dark green. Um, I think that that gives a, a nice level of brightness combined with subtlety. Uh, so that's a great combination there. And then uh, more seed heads and grasses. And if you are really paying attention, you can see the times that you get something like the most subtle little frost. And if you're a nature photographer, you can seize the moment to get a picture like this one uh, that is probably not something you would see if you weren't really paying attention. Uh, and then here's a, an example of something that is much more green, even though it's winter. So a lot more evergreen plants filling in. Uh, going back to our discussion of native evergreens, you're not going to be able to accomplish something quite this green with our native plant palette, probably. Uh, if you do, I want to hear about it because uh, I, would, I would love to know how to be more evergreen and more native and make that work. Um, but chances are you're going to be using some exotic plants in a scheme like this one. And okay, that's it. We'll, we'll leave the pretty picture up. And in fact, I think I'm gonna leave that pretty picture up. And Sally, if there are questions, we have officially two minutes left. And anybody who needs to go, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you wanna stick around, I have time and we can stick around and do some questions. Thank you. All right, well, we got time for a few questions. Um, quick note, if you have to go, um, or if we don't get to your question, please feel free to follow up by email. Um, there was a lot of interest in evergreens and my colleague David is actually offering a class at 2 p.m. on conifers. He'll be talking a lot about care. So for those of you who are emailing us questions about issues you're experiencing, that might be a good class to either check the recording or attend. Um, so send me a note. And now to questions. Um, so the first question, um, we have, hang on, sorry. I'm gonna try and go through some of the more general questions here. Um, do you know for camellias, can they tolerate harsh afternoon sun or are those really more of a shade plant morning sun type if you really like camellias? So camellias are definitely more uh, shade preferring, particularly in the heat of the afternoon. In the winter, they, if they get winter afternoon sun, not a big deal. If they're getting summer afternoon sun, it's probably going to be too hot for them and burn their leaves up. Um, in the winter time, the, the sun thing is funny about morning sun. Normally, Amelia is going to be very pleased with morning sun and afternoon shade. However, in the event that it froze overnight and then the sun is very bright in the morning, you sometimes can get a winter burn phenomenon out of that. Probably the favorite 
place for a camellia is some kind of a more dappled shade type arrangement uh, where it, it, the sun is never harsh on it at all, but it has enough sun that it's gonna bloom. You can't put them in deep shade and expect any bloom out of them. So um, there, if you can get that, that siding right, they're super easy and low maintenance and you don't worry about them. Okay, thanks, Mary Kirk. All right, we'll go ahead and just take one more question. Um, we've had a few people asking about the correct time if you're leaving some of those perennials, grasses, and those types of things up. Is there a correct time to go ahead and trim them back for the spring? I know some people, different people have different suggestions or preferences. So do you have any recommendations? I do. Um, and I don't know if you'll find this in any official book. And so somebody out there might say that I am incorrect, but this is what I do and what I find to be successful. Um, your ultimate deadline is to catch everything before it breaks dormancy and starts to grow again. It, imagine a grass with all those little pieces po poking up. If you cut it back and you clip the tips, you've made your plant ugly for the whole next year. Uh, it's not gonna, you know, those tips are not going to grow back. So if you want to avoid doing that, you need to catch it before the tips come up, or you need to be very, very careful in how you prune, which who has time for that? So you wanna catch things before they bloom uh, or before they break dormancy, excuse me. When, when is that? That can be anywhere going back to when they stop being green. Once um, a plant has stopped being green, it's not, the, that foliage isn't doing anything for the plant anymore. And so it's safe to remove it. And the plants that say like hellebores and cucurs that might kind of stay green or purple or whatever through the winter, you'll begin to see as it gets toward the end of the winter that those, they, even though they are still green, they're very dull and uh, sometimes coarse and ready to come off. So I consider it something of a rolling time frame. And I use the rule of thumb, whenever it looks bad, cut it off. Um, and then draw your deadline at before it breaks dormancy. The other way I like to think about this is that there is always, always some beautiful 60 degree day in February. So on that beautiful 60 degree day in February, when you wanna run outside and you even you know, pull on a pair of shorts because you're just so ready, but what do you do? What is there to do in the garden on the 60 degree day in February? Cut everything back. That's the perfect day. Uh, chances are the next week's going to be dreary and awful and you're not going to get to it. And then the week after that is busy and the following week is some holiday thing. And then, oh my goodness, the plants spread dormancy and now it's a chore. So 60 degree day in February, just get it done, get it all cut back. All right. Thank you so much, Mary Kirk. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Um, just to remind you all, if you want to attend that Evergreens, uh, the, sorry, the conifers class at 2 p.m., send me an email. Um, I will be checking emails a little bit for a couple minutes after class and then a couple minutes before two o'clock um, so I can help you guys out. Thank you, Mary Kirk, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. We've had some nice notes coming in about the class. Um, do you have anything oh, you want to close with before we end for the day? Um, sure, sure. Enjoy. Enjoy the winter. Don't just bury your head until it's spring again. Uh, pay attention to what's going on. Uh, put on your boots and get outside uh, and, and learn something that you never knew before. All right. Thank you so much, Mary Kirk. Everybody have a great day and we look forward to seeing you at another class. Have a good afternoon. Thanks guys. Bye.